Up next, Dan Shaw, who is a civil servant from Salisbury studying maths and physics at the Open University in his spare time with a focus, on a focus and interest in astrophysics and the first person who's able to write a serious, proper bio description. <laughs> Put your hands together for Dan! Ladies and gentlemen, there is a problem in astronomy. I present to you one of the most beautiful sights in the night sky, Venus. <laughs> I present to you Mars, <laughs> Jupiter's moons, <laughs> shielded by our own planet Saturn. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, even the sun is not immune to this phenomenon. <laughs> if you're an astronomer, the moon is a gigantic pain in the backside. <laughs> Gets in the way, and if you want to make observations of deep field objects, it, the moonlight just washes everything out. So for days of the month, you just can't do anything productive. This is a problem that needs to be solved. We have multiple options, and I'll investigate each of these in turn, <laughs> building more and more on feasibility. <laughs> so our first option is we do nothing. The moon is slowly moving away of its own accord due to tidal forces. We just let it carry on. Um, there is a slight problem that this will take a while. <laughs> um, the... The astrophysicists amongst you will note that the remaining lifespan life of the sun is only five billion years. So unfortunately, this isn't really a viable option. However, it is cheap. <laughs> Our second option is slightly more proactive. Uh, if we can't um, wait for it to disappear of its own accord, we paint the near side black. <laughs> That way, blending it in against the background. We won't solve the obscuration problem, where it gets in the way of everything, but it does stop it shining so much. And this is actually quite feasible. So what you do is you take a rocket, you fill it full of black paint, and you point it straight at the moon. <laughs> where it gets to an opt optimum distance, you essentially airburst it, and a big splash of black paint lands on the moon. It's quicker and easier than getting astronauts out with rollers. <laughs> An absolute waste of talent, uh, time, and inefficiency. So, we are talking quite a large area. It's about the size of Russia. But, the amount, of, the amount of paint that we would need, it would require chemical production to be scaled up slightly. But you'll note that the, the, the money that we're talking here is not insurmountable. The rockets, however, I decided... <laughs> but um, there's two factors to this. Uh, first off, if we take the Apollo program as an example, for every dollar the Americans put in, they got $10 out into their economy. <laughs> so if you add 12 quadrillion to the global economy, then the Chancellor of the Exchequer will uh, throw you a ticker tape parade and you'll be knighted in the New Year's Honours list. Uh, and the best part of this is, is that uh, somewhere in California right now, Elon Musk is getting very excited and he doesn't know why. <laughs> Our third option, the astute view will note that that is not the moon, it is Ceres. The moon is covered in craters, so we're going to add another one. If we take a big asteroid <laughs> and crash it into the moon, then all you have to do is overcome the binding energy of the moon, the energy that keeps every single part of the moon attached to every single other part. All you have to do is get Ceres going at 16 kilometers per second, which, as it's currently going at 17 kilometers per second around the sun anyway, you've only got to knock a kilometer per second off its current velocity. This isn't actually that hard. Um, there could be some side effects, but we can get around these. So, <laughs> we have a slight problem in that on Earth, 
There are people. <laughs> so if we get series crashing into it, there's going to be a lot of debris. This could pose a problem. However, if we take all the people... <laughs> This seems fairly foolproof. <laughs> there is, however, one slightly bigger issue, which is fuel. <laughs> if you take the rocket equation and you actually do the maths, we assume uh, hydrogen as a fuel because it's, it's uh, most abundant. It turns out that you actually need a, a rocket about one and a half times bigger than the series itself. And the amount of fuel you need is 1.5 times 10 to the 21 kilograms, which is an almost mind-boggling sort of figure. However, just to put that in context, that is the mass of all of the oceans on Earth. <laughs> Hydrogen and oxygen. <laughs> so all we do is we take all of the water on Earth, <laughs> we take it to series, we break it apart into its component parts, we reassemble it, stick it through a big rocket, and then bingo, you've got the fuel you need for the delta V calculation. This also has the upside of um, no one's going to complain about the fact that there's no tides anymore. <laughs> if there is no ocean. Our fourth option is to take the moon and to apply a very large laser, <laughs> which I cannot name because Disney will sue me. We also take a well-known um, theologian and uh, excellent web comic cartoonist saying, shoot for the moon. If you miss, shoot again, and one of us will soon destroy that stupid sky circle. <laughs> the main problem with this, however, is technological infeasibility. We just cannot build this kind of laser. In order to uh, overcome the binding energy of the sun, uh, sorry, of the moon in less than a second, you've got to have the energy production of the sun for 15 minutes put into one big powerful burst. Unfortunately, there's only one place close enough to the moon to build such a large laser, and that's right here on Earth. This would have the slight downside of reducing Earth's entire atmosphere to plasma. <laughs> so there would be a slight body count with this of about 7 billion. <laughs> Our final option is the Dyson Planetary Motor. Uh, which was invented during the 1960s. And what it essentially is, is you take the moon, you wrap it in large concentric bands of conductive material, and you put a huge amount of uh, potential difference in it, put a huge amount of voltage to it, and you turn the moon, you stick an electric field around it, and you're essentially turning the moon into a giant AC motor. <laughs> you then take asteroids, and you fly them through this field, and if they're made of conductive material, which most asteroids are, this induces a current. All that angular momentum has to go somewhere. The asteroid's under, uh, undergoing resistance, and so you start to induce torque onto the moon, and it starts to spin. Eventually, with enough asteroids, it'll start to spin faster and faster. And an object placed on the moon's equator will eventually be going at orbital velocity. If we take the asteroid, fling it back around the sun, pick up its angular momentum from there, so essentially you are taking the sun's angular momentum and you're putting it into the moon. Do it with enough asteroids. <laughs> and eventually the moon will literally turn into an oblate spheroid and break apart in a slow, serene manner that would avoid the asteroid problem of crashing Ceres into it the moon would essentially just fall to bits. This is entirely feasible because most of the resources we will need are, are actually currently on the moon itself. Uh, we would need to build a lot of fusion reactors there. However, uh, every single theoretical physicist I've spoken to has assured me that it's simply a case of getting the atoms going very fast and really close to each other, which apparently sounds really quite simple. So... <laughs> This is entirely with intolerable technology li limits. The major upside for astronomy is that once the moon is gone, we'll be able to watch ring formation up close, making Earth 
several thousand times sexier and more attractive <laughs> to any visiting aliens. <laughs> now, if we take all of our concepts <laughs> and we put them into a matrix, we can actually work out which is more feasible. Now, with my apologies to the panel, I am not an economist. <laughs> However, I have taken the liberty of stating that if a plan kills everyone on Earth, it's probably not economically feasible. <laughs> so we can then rank them, rate them, and we can conclusively and empirically say that destroying the moon with a Dyson motor is 2.16 times better than just leaving it be. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I shall now take a series of shorter speeches disguised as questions. <laughs> So um, I'm not an astronomer, um, but I'd like to encourage you to think a little bigger. Uh, <laughs> Go on. Uh, isn't the real problem in observation the sun? <laughs> well, unfortunately, in this case, I think that uh, option one is probably the best option, um, because uh, spinning up the sun, I'm afraid, is just totally infeasible. Uh, awfully sorry. You oh, no. <laughs> an actual <laughs> astrophysicist. You started off your, your presentation by saying that the reason you wanted to get rid of the moon was because it got in the way of observations. Have you calculated what effect these new rings would have on observations <laughs> that you've created around the Earth? Well, that would be the upside, because at the moment, within the solar system, there is no opportunity to witness ring formation up close. So, yes there would be a slight uh, glow. However, <laughs> unlike the moon, which is constantly varying and fluxing, it would be a constant. So all you have to do is work out the magnitude of the current light flux and just deduct it from every single observation, <laughs> simplifying the mathematics of astronomy considerably. 